there's a story of four preachers who got together regularly to fellowship, but the more they met, the more they started to realize it was kind of shallow. They were just talking and amongst themselves, and it didn't seem to go anywhere, and they were trying to figure out this problem when one of them finally said, look, guys, you know what our problem is? We never confess to each other our sins. You know, other people come to us, our congregation, our parishioners, they come to us, they tell us their worst sins. Uh, we pray with them. You know, confession is good for the soul. We need to do that for each other. That would take us deeper. And the guys were kind of like, whoa, 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 that's a little crazy, but maybe. And they finally convinced each other they would do this. They would each share their darkest sin with this little group. And so in trepidation, finally one of them started and he said, okay, 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 I'll tell you this, I've never told anybody this in my life, nobody knows this, uh, but I love cigars, like love them, like it's bad. I mean, I actually have a, them in my office, I have them at home, not even my wife knows, but I like regularly sneak out and smoke cigars and I know it's horrible and I know I shouldn't and I know... You know, I shouldn't keep it a secret, blah, 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 but, and all the other guys just got big eyes, you know, they're like, whoa, you're messed up, but they didn't say that out loud, you know, they just thought that, but then they thought, well, I got my own sin to confess, so they're, you know, so the next guy, he was a little more nervous to go, and but they finally coaxed it out of him, and he said, okay, you want to know the truth about my darkest sin, nobody knows, is that when I get alone, um, my mouth, that sounds so sweet and nice, you know, other times of the week, um, I can really get some bad language. In fact, uh, when I'm alone, if I get frustrated, you know, I could make a sailor, a swearing sailor, sound like a saint. Um, just the way my, uh, if I'm driving, you know, and he starts to explain, and they're like, okay, okay, enough, enough, you know. Uh, we get it. Wow, that's, that's bad. You're messed up, you know. They didn't say that, but they thought that. And so uh, they, they uh, okay, you know, and uh, finally they coaxed the third guy to go, and he said, well, mine's pretty easy. Um, I, I hate to admit this, but I'm like addicted to TV. Like I'll get a TV show or actually like five or ten TV shows and I just watch and watch and watch and watch and I can't think about anything else. And in fact, when Netflix came out, it was the worst thing ever for me because I would just, you know, turn that and watch all nine. In fact, I, I, I hate to admit this. This is kind of the, the, the worst part of it, but I've actually skipped church a few times, you know, called in sick um, just so I could keep watching my show. And they're like, you're the pastor. You know, you get calling sick. Why, well, you know? Uh, but they're like holding it back, right? Because they're all confessing their sins. And so they get to the fourth guy and the guy just won't own up. He won't. He's just like, no, I'm not. I'm good. You guys did great. You know, thanks. And they're like, you got to share. We shared ours. He's like, no, I can't. No, no. And then finally they coax him to share. And he says, okay, okay, you really want to know what my sin is? It's gossip. And I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> Woo, right? <laughs> Here's the deal. Uh, getting real about our sin, getting honest about our sins is very difficult for us. It's difficult for a number of reasons. I, I think it's difficult partly just because self-awareness is hard. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we live our lives looking outward more than we look inward. That's the way our eyeballs are set up. It's also the way our, the eyes of our soul are set up. And it's a lot easier for us to look outside and see everybody else's problems, everybody else's faults. But it takes uh, uh, some maturity to learn self-reflection and it takes some time. And we often don't take the time or have the maturity to actually look in the mirror uh, and so that's one of the reasons it's hard to get real about our sin. A another reason why it's hard to get real about our sin is because our hearts, they're tricky, you know? Um, in fact, the Bible says our hearts can be deceitfully wicked. Uh, and, and we have an amazing ability as human beings to lie to ourselves. In fact, did you know this? That, that the person that you'll have the hardest time figuring out the truth from is you. It's you. Uh, it's amazing how easy it is for us to allow what's called the self-serving bias, you know, to, to, to skew the information to make us look better than we are. And so that's another reason. But I think the, the, the biggest reason why it's hard to get real, to get brutally honest about our sin, is simply because it's painful. It hurts. It's, it's unpleasant to see our own sin. It's unpleasant to think the thought that I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Just saying that was unpleasant, right? You're a dirty, rotten 
sinner. Oh, who wants to hear that, right? Uh, 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 hearing that, and, and yeah, that's, it's a painful thing to, to, to realize what Scripture tells us, right? That Scripture tells us that we, in and of ourselves, outside of Christ, we are completely and fundamentally messed up. And, you know, I'm proud of you right now, actually, for not just standing up and marching out of here, you know, mad at the preacher. You're like, who does this guy think he is? That comes across very judgmental, very condemning. And so before you, you know, uh, uh, get mad and go, um, my goal today is actually to offer freedom from judgmentalism, from guilt, from condemnation, even from low self-esteem. Uh, but you have to kind of work with me to get there, okay? Because really, this whole series, No Perfect People, is about setting us free, setting God's church free from an attitude that is sin-focused and sin-condemning. And I believe that Jesus, I believe that Jesus saw religious self-righteousness, you know, pride, arrogance, judgmentalism, prejudice, those kind of things. I believe Jesus saw religious self-righteousness as the greatest scourge that kept people from coming to God. I do. In fact, just this week, I opened my Bible to the book of Matthew. I started in chapter 1, and I just paged through the first gospel and, and, and just noticed how Jesus took so much time and energy to attack the, the, the religious self-righteousness of the day. In fact, just the way he was born. I mean, God being born as a baby, that was offensive to the religious of the day. Being born in an obscure town, uh, having the, 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 the Gentiles invited in on the birth, right? The, the wise men coming from a distant country, that was offensive to the religion of the day. Having shepherds, kind of the lowlifes of that day, invited to the occasion. Having animals around, all of these things. Having it, it be an unwed pregnancy, even though it was a virgin birth, it was scandalous in that day and certainly offensive uh, to the, the religious of the day. And then, of course, the way Jesus chose his disciples, that he would pick the likes of those that he picked was offensive to the religious of the day. The way he healed on the Sabbath, one time, very angry at the religious self-righteousness of people who would be offended at him healing on the Sabbath. The way that he cleansed the temple from uh, uh, spiritual and religious abuse. The way uh, that he would teach over and over about the inner realities of the heart mattering more than the outer conformity of our lives. Not that the outer peace doesn't matter, but that he kept driving past that, saying religion tries to ignore the inner realities. And Jesus would teach this again and again, trying to break down the walls of religious superiority. I mean, even the way he died, right? Offending the religious folks. And, and, and them leading the way in crucifying him, and then hanging between two thieves and looking at one of them and saying, uh, you don't have to do any works. You're dying today. But by grace, by his mercy, you're welcomed into paradise. So offensive to uh, uh, self Righteousness. I just want to show you one scripture about this. I wish I could read the whole chapter, but we don't have time. This is Jesus and how brutally intense he got when he attacked self-righteousness. Matthew chapter 23, the whole chapter's on this, but I'll just read a few verses. This is what he says. Blind guides, you strain out your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Whoa. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. In other words, fakes, you're wearing a mask. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. <laughs> wow. First wash the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the religious law and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, <clears throat> but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. So here's Jesus just saying, religious superiority, pretense, faking, all those things, these are keeping people, they're keeping you from coming to the God of the universe. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just attack that. He builds something else. And what he builds is a community of people who are not characterized by their judgment about sin. They're characterized by their love. They're characterized by God's forgiveness. They're characterized by servant-heartedness. And, and Jesus casts a vision for a community he calls his church. And he says, I, I want my church to be a place that instead of running around cursing the darkness, that actually shines a light 
into the darkness. He, he casts a vision for his church to be a place where the broken and the wounded and the sinner and the outcast are welcomed. A church, as I said last week, that is not a museum for saints, but that's a hospital for sinners. And you know, when, when you have sin, or, or sorry, sickness in your life, and I, I mentioned this last week, when you have sickness in, in your body, you don't go into the hospital and pretend it's not there, hoping they'll check you in, right? You're like, I'm fine, please let me in. No, you, you, you're, you're there knowing that the, the only way to get in is to be vulnerable about your sickness. That's what qualifies you. And that's the exact same way that God intended his church to be. Not a, a perfect place for perfect people who have to hide every fault and error in order to get in, but a place for, for broken people to say, I'm a mess and I need this. I need God's love and God's grace. A place where our sin is not rubbed in, but where our sin is rubbed out. And the sad reality the sad reality is that many people in our culture, though they're favorable towards Jesus, they have an impression, a perception about Jesus' followers that we are judgmental, closed-minded, and opinionated, that we're uh, intolerant and arrogant and exclusive rather than inclusive. Now, some of that reputation is earned, right? We deserve it. Uh, some of it is just people's own excuses, right, and their own uh, uh, faulty perceptions, and, and some of it, maybe a lot of it, is due to just propaganda, right? Messages that get out there in our culture. But the reality is that God's dream for his church is just the opposite. God's dream for his church is that we would be the most accepting and loving place on earth, a place where we're loved and accepted and cared about and free to be ourselves, free to be messed up. And Jesus has a ton of material on this in the Gospels. And so today, I, I just want to continue on with this theme, and I, I want to talk about a story, John chapter 8, and if you have your Bibles, you can look there with me. Uh, this is a pretty powerful story that happens in the life of Jesus when he's confronted with the sin of another person, and uh, we're going to look at how he responds to it and learn some lessons about ourselves and how we can lose some of that self-righteousness in our own lives. So, John chapter 8, verse 3. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Now, you just have to kind of stop there and go, hang, hang on, what's happening? It's an interesting thing about uh, uh, religion, self-righteousness, or sort of wanting to point out sin and get it dealt with. There, uh, you, you lose this sense of care for the individual. Do you, you notice that in this story? There's no heart for this lady. There's no care for her. There's sort of a bringing her before the people, kind of flaunting it. And something that happens to us when we become judgmental or self-righteous, on the outside, it looks pretty good, right? This is wrong, this has to get dealt with, blah, blah, blah. But on the inside, when we look into our hearts, we see something very different, something that is uncaring, unloving, and so forth. The other thing that I think you have to stop and notice right here is just, hang on a sec, there's a woman caught in the act of adultery, the act of adultery takes two people, right? Not one. And there's only one person shown up here. Again, this is the way judgmentalism and self-righteousness works. It just sort of picks and chooses and rah, right? So, uh, teacher, they said to Jesus, this is verse 4, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. And then I love what Jesus does. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. There's all kinds of conjecture about what he might have written in the dust. Some of the ideas are pretty neat and, and pretty cool. But what I think is powerful about the fact that he does this is he forces everyone to pause. Again, one of the fascinating things or, or terribly fascinating things about judgmentalism or about attacking sin is that we come at it with kind of an aggression. This is wrong. This has to be dealt with. Something must be done. Let's do something. Do it now. Ah. And you see the speed at which we start to move? And what happens is we don't stop to reflect. We don't stop to think. We don't stop to, to gain perspective. And I think one of the reasons Jesus stoops down to right here is he's just like, hey, everybody, hold on. Slow this thing down. Don't be too hasty. There's lots of, in, in Scripture about haste and what it does to us. So Jesus slows down the conversation they, in verse 7, they kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again. All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. What an awesome statement. 
Then he stooped down again, just to give him some time to reflect, just give him some time to think. He stooped down again and wrote in the dust. And when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Don't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. It's the only words we ever hear from her. Just, no, Lord, no one's condemning me. And Jesus said, neither do I. Which is so cool, because he's the only one who had the right to. He was the only one who was there who was sinless. But he said, I won't condemn you. I'm going to offer you mercy. I'm going to offer you grace. Go and sin no more. Now notice he doesn't say, go and do whatever you please. I'm a nice guy. You can just live however you want because, hey, I'm gracious, I'm nice, I'm sweet. It's no big deal. He says, go, I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to offer you mercy. I'm the only one who can truly offer you this. And now go and sin no more. So what can we learn from this? I want us to learn three lessons by relating to some of the folks in the story. And the first group that I think we need to relate to is the crowd, or really the accusers. And in doing so, we need to start to look within and see the Pharisee in all of us. Uh, We're invited in Scripture to get real. God does this all the way through Scripture, especially in Jesus, but all the way through Scripture. God says, get rid of your pretense. Get rid of your faking. Get rid of having outer things without it being true and authentic on the inside. That God is constantly inviting us to shed the mask of hypocrisy that all of us tend to hide behind. In fact, the, the Greek word for sincere that's used in the New Testament to be sincere, it actually means to be without wax. To be without wax. What would happen in that day is you'd go to the marketplace and you would buy clay things for, for your meals at home, for cooking and, and eating from. And so you'd get a clay cup or a clay jar and so on. And uh, to make it look pretty, they, they'd put wax on it. But what you didn't know is whether or not it was cracked. <laughs> and so if you'd go home and you'd pour a liquid, especially a hot liquid, into your jar, into your cup, you'd find out right away whether you couldn't see it on the outside, but you'd find out quite quickly whether or not it was cracked. And what sincere means is to be without wax. In other words, it doesn't mean not, don't be cracked, don't be broken. It just means be real about your cracks. Be real about your brokenness. And that's a tough thing to do. But you know, in the Bible, in the Bible, those who never doubt or never struggle with their faith, those who have absolute certainty and state truth emphatically, those are the ones who crucified Christ. In the Bible, actually, there are those who struggled with doubt, guys like John the Baptist, who could proclaim one day, there's the Lamb of God, and then through some persecution said, are you really the one? Uh, Guys like Peter, who would fail again and again, and yet learn through that failure, uh, find a God who could accept him and love him. My favorite example of this is a guy named David, who the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. And yet, I'll tell you one thing about David. When you read through the Psalms, you don't see a guy filled with pretense. You don't see a guy who just kind of puts on a show and says, I've got it all together. When you read through the Psalms, you see a guy who's vulnerable and honest about his doubts, about his struggles, about his inner battles and his brokenness. And there's the man who's after God's own heart. I I love how uh, Judah Smith says this. He says, before we get too furious with the Pharisees, we must realize that inside of each of us is a Pharisee trying to get out. It's happened to me. No sooner do I conquer a bad habit than I become the biggest critic of anyone who still does what I just stopped doing. Been there? Here's what I do. I make up laws or rules that fit my standard of living, and then I judge you by them. If you follow my rules, you're a good person. If you break my rules, you're a bad person. And then I love this. If you have stricter rules than me, then you're a prude who needs to lighten up, right? I mean, this is the, this is the challenge for all human beings. It doesn't matter where you stand or where you draw your lines. Once we draw a line somewhere and determine something's right or wrong, and then we kind of stand on that line or figure that out. And, and it's even worse when we, see, when we see the weakness in us, then we kind of accept it in others or we love others anyway. We say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. But if we conquer that area, right, we, we get, then we're like, oh, I can't believe they haven't figured that out yet. Man, right? 
It's amazing. And then, of course, what, what blows me away so much is judging judgmentalism. On the other side, you know, if you have a conscience that's stronger than mine and you can't do certain things or, or, or watch certain things or uh, participate in certain things because you believe they're wrong and, and I have the freedom on the other side, I can look that way and go, oh, man, can you believe how legalistic they are? Can you believe how judgmental they are? I hope you see the irony in that. It takes courage and humility and honesty to recognize that we are as messed up as any sinner next door to us. And a lot of times we never get that honest with ourselves. And until we get that honest, what tends to happen to us is we tend to whitewash our own dark sides and we tend to emphasize other people. Uh, Judah Smith goes on to say this. He says, really, there's four stages I must go through. First, I start with I'm a good person. I'm justified in criticizing bad people. I grow up from that to say I'm, I'm a good person, but I should show compassion to bad people. I've learned something. Finally, the switch flips, and I realize truth is I'm a sinner who needs just as much help as the next guy. And then where beauty takes place, where, where transformation happens in the heart, is when I realize the fourth stage, I am loved by Jesus just as I am, and so is everyone else. And Judah says this, he says, I have to keep reminding myself to live in stage four because I tend to regress without even noticing. So that's the first thing we can learn from this story. Is identify with the Pharisee. Realize that there's Pharisee in me that tries to cover up and get real. The, the second thing is to identify with the woman. Identify with that adulterer and see the brokenness in me. You see, once we get real, once we get honest, about our lives, we start to see the, the, the junk in us. And of course, that's what Jesus was inviting everyone there to do when he said he was without sin, let him cast the first stone. Um, this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, Brendan Manning, he says it this way. He says, we fluctuate between castigating ourselves and congratulating ourselves because we're deluded into thinking we save ourselves. But when you've made a sobering mess of your life, as many of us alcoholics have, compassion becomes a tad easier if you're conscientious in taking your own inventory rather than someone else's. I just love the last part of that. When we become conscientious in taking our own inventory rather than everybody else's. You know, sometimes we tend to believe that Jesus came and he, he, he took the law, God's standard, and he said, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. I'm nice and I'm forgiving and I'm merciful. So you can just do whatever you want, live however you want, and, and we're, we'll be good. You know, Jesus actually did the opposite of that. I don't know how many of you have actually studied out some of the sayings of Jesus. Although he attacked self-righteousness, he actually invited people to live righteously. In fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached, you know, one, one of the statements he makes, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of God. He, he says, you think the Pharisees are, are up on this? You got to do better than that. And he begins to go through God's law. And he says, you know, you, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. And you can almost imagine the crowd going, yeah, yeah, I remember that law. I love that law. I never broken that law. I'm good. Right? Then he goes, actually, you know what I say to you? It goes deeper than that. If you've even thought about it, if you've even been angry with somebody, if you've even spoken a, 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 a negative word to somebody else, you're guilty of murder. And then Jesus mentions another command. You know, you've heard the, 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 the command, don't commit adultery. And again, you can kind of imagine the crowd kind of going, hey, doing pretty good there, doing pretty good. Right, nudge, nudge to your spouse, you know. And then Jesus goes, you know what I'm saying though? If you even look at a woman lustfully in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Oh, you talk about deflating. You know what Jesus does? He doesn't say there is no law. He says, the standard of God is so high, no human being will ever reach it, ever. The, the, the point that Jesus is making is not, you're all messed up, so that's okay, just live however you please. The point that Jesus is making is, you are all messed up. <laughs> Let me show it to you this way. This is Romans chapter 3, the way it says it. Uh, the purpose of the law is to keep people from having excuses, to show that the entire world is guilty before God, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. It puts us all in the same place where we say, I am broken, I am in desperate 
need of God's grace. Here's how Paul said it in 1 Timothy. Christ came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his patience, even with the worst of sinners. Then others would realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. You see, what he's saying is not, so sin's no big deal. What he's saying is, so everybody must realize that we've all messed up, we're all broken, we're all fundamentally flawed outside of Christ. And it's in realizing that. Uh, let, me, let me put it this way, and I'll, I'll go deeper in this in the next point. But sin needs stronger medicine than tolerance. Okay? Hear this. Sin needs stronger medicine than tolerance. What our world wants to say in our day is, oh, just be tolerant. Just be tolerant. Just tolerate each other. Sin needs stronger medicine than that. Jesus never tolerated sin. He showed it grace. It's a far deeper, far more powerful thing. Erwin Lutzer said this, when the mask of self-righteousness has been torn from us and we stand stripped of all our accustomed defenses, we are candidates for God's generous grace. So we've seen the, the, the accusers and we go, man, there's, there's Pharisee in me. I have to take off my masks. We see the adulterer. Instead of pointing our fingers, we can point right back at ourselves and say, oh me, I'm the one who's in need of grace. And then we're invited to look away from ourselves and look to the Savior and we discover God's forgiveness. We discover grace. You know, the point of the law is to point out our sin so that we'll look away from us. As long as we live under rules, under self-righteousness, we look to ourselves to be good and on one side we congratulate ourselves or we look to ourselves as bad and on the other side we beat ourselves up. Under grace, we have a totally different path. It's not congratulate or beat yourself up. It's beloved. Beloved because Christ himself, he didn't uh, uh, um, just say sin is no big deal. He absorbed our sin. He paid the price for our sin on the cross. He bore the wrath of God on your behalf and on my behalf. And that's where grace comes from. It's strong medicine. It's a tougher deal. Let me try to build the case here uh, just about the difference between grace and tolerance. Um, this is by John Burke. Here's what he says. Though the world cannot offer grace, in its absence it has found an inexpensive substitute, tolerance. The very idea of tolerance implies enduring or putting up with something you don't like or value. Our culture diets on the candy of tolerance, but what it really craves is the meat of grace. Tolerance does not value people, but simply puts up with their behaviors or beliefs. Tolerance alone cannot accommodate both justice and mercy. It can only look the other way. Tolerance might deal with differences, but it can't embrace us in the full knowledge of sin and remove our guilt. Do you see the difference? In our world, we just want to tolerate, right? Just tolerate me. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever I please, and you should just tolerate it. But is that really what the human heart longs for? Just to be tolerated? You know, if, if I come up to you and say, what do you think of me? And you say, I tolerate you. <laughs> and yet our world goes around and says, you should, you know, tolerate, tolerate, tolerate. Really? Is that all you want? Just tolerating? Is that all we should do? Just look the other way? We don't like each other, but we'll tolerate. Grace does something so different. Grace says, instead of pretending there's no sin there, we'll acknowledge sin uh, right in the face, but instead of, instead of tolerating you, instead of rejecting you, we'll let Christ pay the price for that sin and we'll, we'll embrace. Grace embraces us. It's a far more powerful medicine and it changes our lives. You know, if you find a, a beautiful painting, maybe a Rembrandt painting out in the mud somewhere, or maybe on the street corner and it's got mud splashed on it. Uh, you, you don't just take that and try to wipe it off, right? Because you wreck it. But at the same time, that would be kind of the self-righteous method. At the same time, you don't just take it and say, well, we'll just ignore it. Mud and all, there it is. Beautiful painting. No, what you do is you take it to a master. You take it to somebody who knows how to clean it up. You take it to somebody who's got that ability and that skill and you bring it to them. And that's exactly what God has done with us. He hasn't just said, yeah, yeah, just stay the way you are. But on the other hand, he, he hasn't just kind of said, you know, <laughs> perfect yourself. No, he said, come to me. I have a, a medicine stronger, a grace 
through what Christ did on the cross. And you know what the beautiful thing is? When we receive grace, we can offer grace. When we get God's kind of love, we get to offer that kind of love. When we see other people who are messed up, we don't just say, oh, that's fine, just do whatever you please. But on the other hand, we don't just say, let me fix you. What we do is we say, let me lead you to one. I know there's an answer for this. I know there's a solution for this. I love you enough to lead you to one who can forgive your sins and who can transform your life. Isn't that beautiful about Jesus? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He cleanses us from our sin, but then he cleanses us from our sinfulness on an ongoing journey. He invites us to transformation. And the more we spend time with our Savior the more we become like him. The deeper we allow God's transforming work of love and grace in our own lives, the, the, the more capable we become of sharing that with others. So how do we lose religious superiority? We discover the Pharisee in us. It helps us become more authentic. We get real. Um, we discover the, the failure in us. It, it helps us be broken. Um, and then we discover the forgiver who is for us. And he fills us with a kind of love that we could never know any other way. He doesn't just tolerate us. He loves us by bearing our sins himself and then offering us his righteousness. And, um, you know, last Sunday, last Sunday, I, just before the, the second service, I had a, a, just a wonderful elderly gal who was just a, a, a saint, you know, one of those people that you'd just, think, oh man, if we could all be like her, we're good, you know? And just before the service, she came in to come to the, the second service and she said, I'm so excited that we're doing this No Perfect People series because I need it. I feel like such a failure sometimes. I felt like such a failure this week and I just couldn't wait to get to church today to just get a dose of grace, right? To get loved by God, to get reminded that it's not about my perfection, it's about Christ. And I just stood there. I, actually, I said to her, I said, if a saint like you needs this, <laughs> we all need it. But I got reflecting on that after. And I just, and, and actually, one of the things she said to me, she said, I hope this is a long series because I need it. <laughs> you know, I got thinking about that after. I thought, I hope this is a forever series. I, I hope this church is always a place where we look forward to coming broken, messed up, failing, and, and, and go, I need a fresh dose of that grace. I need a fresh dose of that kind of love. I need an unconditionally loving God to meet me. I need a place where no matter who I am or how I've been or what my week's been like, I can meet the God who encourages and who lifts. That's the kind of church I long for us to be, church. And we become that just the more we get that. I believe God's meant his church to be the best place in the world to go when you need encouragement, when you need a lift, when you need forgiveness. We represent, we represent the God who lavishly and unconditionally and infinitely loves us. I'll close with this quote. This is Nancy Spielberg. Love this. Lord, I, craw I crawled across the barrenness to you with uh, my empty cup, uncertain in asking any small drop of refreshment. Then she encounters grace. If only I had known you better, I'd have come running with a bucket. Why don't we stand together? We'll close in prayer.